सो हेलो स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज प्रतीक भसीन नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू टीच यू द सेकेंड क्लास फॉर मनी एंड बैंकिंग टूडे वील बी डिस्कसिंग द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट पार्स ऑफ द सेंट्रल बैंक दैट इज इट्स मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी अंडर मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी द सेंट्रल बैंक यूजेज इट्स पार टू कंट्रोल इन्फ्लेशन एंड डिफ्लेशन इन द इकोनॉमी इन्फ्लेशन रेफर्स टू increase in the purchasing power of the public which leads to increase in the prices of the economy it is harmful for the economy because the poor people are forced to buy commodities at a higher price which is beyond their purchasing power similarly on the other hand deflation refers to a fall in price due to a fall in purchasing power this causes harm to the producer because they are forced to sell their commodities at a lower price so what does commercial bank does with its monetary policy so the central bank uses its quantitative and qualitative tools to control inflation and deflation in the economy so let us first discuss what are quantitative tools and the quantitative tools the central bank tries to control the volume of credit available in the economy so if in the economy 20000 crores of credit is available it will try to expand or contract it according to the situations prevailing in the economy so quantitative tools are those tools which control the volume of credit available in the economy so let's suppose in the economy there is 20000 crores as credit so the central bank according to the situations prevailing in the economy will try to increase it or decrease it that is expand credit or contract credit so when we study the tools of quantitative policy the first tool that comes into our mind is bank rate now what is bank rate bank rate is the rate at which commercial banks like state bank of india punjab national bank borrow from central bank as we borrow from commercial banks commercial banks are also forced to borrow money from central bank because sometimes they are short of resources now what does commercial banks pay to the central bank they pay bank rate similarly when we borrow from commercial banks we pay them interest rate now what happens in inflation and deflation as in inflation i have already told you that the central bank forces the commercial banks to lend less money to the public because there is huge purchasing power in the economy as people have more money they spend more and it leads to inflation so the central bank advises the commercial bank that not to lend money but even then commercial banks with their profit motive tend to lend money to the people so what option is left with the central bank it increases the bank rate so as to increase the cost of borrowing in the economy so that people control their aspirations and borrow less from the banks similarly in deflation people have no money or very less money forcing the producers to sell their output at a lesser price and causing huge losses so what aim does central bank have the central bank wants that the commercial bank lends more money to the public so as to increase their purchasing power so it reduces its bank rate so that the cost of borrowing for commercial bank decreases and in turn this benefit is passed on to the public let's move on to the next tool the next tool is liquidity adjustment facility which is divided into two parts repo rate and reverse repo rate like a person who conducts transactions with the bank it can either deposit money with the bank or it can borrow money from the bank in both the cases interest is involved similarly because rbi acts as a banker bank to commercial bank it can also deposit money it can also borrow money that is if state bank of india has surplus funds with itself it can deposit those surplus funds with the central bank 
and earn interest, this interest is known as reverse repo rate. Similarly, when State Bank of India is short of funds, it can borrow money from the central bank and pay interest known as repo rate. Both of these interest rates are for short term. So let me summarize, repo rate is charged by the central bank on the borrowings by commercial banks. Reverse repo rate is charged by the commercial bank on the deposits made to the central bank. At the time of inflation, repo rate and reverse repo rates are increased. This is because when repo rate is increased, the cost of borrowing increases and hence the commercial bank will be able to borrow less. Similarly, reverse repo rate is also increased so that the commercial banks deposit their surplus funds with the central bank in order to earn more interest rates. Similarly, at the time of deflation, repo rate and reverse repo rates are decreased. These are decreased so that people get less money in their hands. Decreasing repo rate will decrease the cost of borrowing by the commercial bank. Similarly, decreasing the reverse repo rate will decrease the surplus funds deposited to the central bank and the commercial bank will be forced to use those surplus funds as loans to the public. Then we come on to our third tool that is open market operations. Open market operations refers to buying and selling of securities in the open market by a central bank. The central bank tries to purchase or sell government securities in the open markets which is in turn purchased by commercial banks, insurance companies or the general public. Because at the time of inflation, there is more purchasing power in the economy or there is more credit creation capacity with the banks, the central bank sells the securities in the market. Due to which, when banks subscribe to those securities, they'll pay their money to the central bank and it will reduce their credit creation capacity. Similarly, at the time of deflation, the banks have less credit creation capacity, so the central bank tries buying back the securities from the banks and giving them a, an increase in their credit creation capacity. So now let's move on to talk about the next quantitative tool, that is legal reserve ratio. Legal reserve ratio is the minimum ratio which is to be kept with the bank itself and the central bank. So this legal reserve ratio is divided into two parts. The first part being statutory liquidity ratio and the next part being cash reserve ratio. Statutory liquidity ratio refers to the ratio of deposits which is kept by commercial bank with itself. This is kept by the commercial bank with itself so as to honor the checks which are deposited into the bank or to make payments to the depositors when they withdraw their money. Similarly, cash reserve ratio as already discussed is the part of deposits or fraction of deposits which the commercial bank is legally bound to keep with the central bank. No interest is paid on it and is not withdrawable on the behest of the commercial bank. Statutory liquidity ratio and CRR both are decided by the central bank. At the time of inflation, as we have already discussed, that the purchasing power of the public and the credit creation capacity of commercial banks is very high. So, the central bank, in order to contract the credit in the economy, increases the statutory liquidity ratio and cash reserve ratio. This reduces the bank's credit creation capacity or loan providing capacity. This happens because when the central bank increases the CRR and SLR, more of the deposits of the commercial bank are bound with itself or the central bank. So it can provide lesser loans. Similarly, at the time of deflation, because the credit creation capacity 
of the commercial banks is very low, the central bank reduces the CRR and SLR. This gives powers to the commercial bank to lend more to the public. This was all about quantitative tools under which we discussed bank rate, liquidity adjustment facility under which we discussed repo rate and reverse repo rate, margin requirement, legal reserve ratio under which we studied about statutory liquidity ratio and cash reserve ratio. So the next type of tools are qualitative tools. Unlike quantitative tools, these tools affect the direction of the credit in the economy. Under these tools, we'll be studying about, first of all, margin requirement. Margin requirement refers to the difference between the value of security offered for loan and the actual amount of loan granted. So the margin is actually a difference between what I offer to the bank and what bank offers to me. So let's suppose if I have a property or a building which costs 100 crores of rupees, the bank won't lend me 100 crores on its security. The bank would obviously loan me a lesser amount. Let's suppose that amount is around 70 crores. So the difference between what I offered to the bank was 100 crores and what the bank offered me was 70 crores. So the difference arises 30 crores. This 30% is known as margin. Now what happens to this margin at the time of inflation and deflation? Because at the time of inflation, the purchasing power of the public and the credit creation capacity of the banks is very high. The central bank tries to curb it. So what it does is it increases the margin. Now let's suppose the margin is increased from 30% to 40%. Now by offering a security of 100 crores, I would only get 60 crores of rupees. This will reduce my purchasing power by 10 crores. At the time of deflation, the opposite happens. So if I offer the bank a property of 100 crores of rupees, the bank would be offering me a loan of 70 crores. That is the margin is 30%. So at the time of deflation, because the purchasing power of the public is very low, the central bank wants to boost the purchasing power. It wants to expand the credit. So the central bank will reduce the margin requirement to 20% so that I get a loan of 80 crores rupees. This will increase my purchasing power by 10 crores. Moving on to our next qualitative tools is rationing of credit. Rationing of credit refers to fixing a quota of credit or quota of loans that can be sanctioned by the commercial bank to a certain sector. Let's suppose RBI is suspicious of some activities in the real estate sectors. So it wants to curb those activities. So it will direct the commercial banks to fix a quota on the activities of real estate so that those activities can be curbed. And if the central bank is apprised that no suspicious activity has taken place, it will remove that quota or increase the quota limit. The third qualitative tool, moral suasion. So moral suasion refers to persuasion on the part of central bank to commercial bank. The central bank persuades the commercial banks to not indulge into giving advances for speculative activities if it is suspicious of that. So at the time of deflation, because the purchasing power of the public is very high, the central bank persuades the commercial bank not to lend for speculative activities. At the time of deflation, because people do not have much purchasing power, the central bank allows or persuades the commercial bank to lend for speculative purposes as well. So this is something persuasion with pressure. So now we come on to the most important topic of your chapter money and banking. We'll be discussing about credit creation. Have you heard that banks also create money? 
sir, this is quite contradictory as to the notion that you said commercial banks do not create money. So how come you say that commercial banks are the manufacturers of money? Students, this happens because commercial bank do not keep all the deposits with themselves. They tend to lend the part of deposits to others as well. So let's suppose a bank receives an amount of rupees 10,000 from a depositor. Assuming that all the transactions take place through the banking structure, the bank keeps a part of deposit and extends the other part as loans. Let's suppose the banks keep the part of 20% as with itself and extends the rest part of rupees 8000 to others. Now what happens is the bank receives 10,000, keeps 2000 with itself and extend 8000 as loan. Now the borrower will deposit that money into its own bank. The same cycle repeats with the next bank. That is, that bank will also keep a part of the deposit received, that is 8000 with itself and extend the other as loan. Now let's suppose this bank also keeps 20% of the deposit, that is 8000 into 20% will give you 1600. So the bank will keep 1600 with itself and extend 6400 rupees as loans. Now this cycle will continue with the next borrower. The next borrower will deposit that money into the bank because we are assuming that all transactions take place through the banking structure. So when 6400 rupees is deposited into the next bank, that bank will also keep a deposit of 20% and extend the rest part as loans. So 6400 multiplied with 20% gives us 1280 rupees. The bank will extend a loan of 5120 rupees. So this cycle would go on until infinity, until the credit creation becomes around 50,000 rupees. So the formula for credit creation is money multiplier into primary deposits. Now you would ask what is primary deposit? Primary deposit is the deposits which are introduced into the banking system for the first time. In our example, it was 10,000 rupees. Money multiplier refers to the number of times the primary deposit increases in relation to the total deposits. So let's suppose that 10,000 rupees has now become 50,000 rupees, so my money multiplier would be five times. The formula for calculating money multiplier is 1 divided by cash reserve ratio. I am assuming cash reserve ratio to be 20%. So when we divide 1 by 20%, we get an answer of 5 times. So whenever in an economy with a money multiplier of 5 times, any amount is introduced, the total credit creation would be 5 times. So the formula for money multiplier is 1 by cash reserve ratio. In my example, I assumed cash reserve ratio to be 20%. So what will happen is, when we divide 1 by 20%, it will yield me an answer of 5 times. Now, because in the economy, the primary deposit was 10,000 rupees and money multiplier is 5 times, it will yield me an answer of 50,000 rupees. This is my credit creation. This concept is based upon a notion that not all the depositors will turn up at once to the bank to withdraw all their deposits. Banks know this very well. Banks have been functioning on this assumption from a very long period of time. They know that whoever has deposited their money in the banks won't turn up to the banks at the same time. So what does bank does is that it keeps a part of deposits so as to honor their depositors and extend the rest as loans and earns huge amount of interest. So now let's talk about money supply. What is money supply? What is the total amount of money that has been supplied into the economy? Or what is the total stock of money 
that is revolving around the money at this point of time. This is known as money supply. So in 1979, the government issued directives to RBI asking what is the total circulation of money at any given point of time. The RBI came up with four components of money supply that is M1, M2, M3 and M4. M1 is also known as narrow money and it is the most liquid form of money because it includes currency and coins with the public, demand deposits with the commercial banks and other deposits with RBI. M1 serves as a medium of exchange function of money as already discussed in the previous class. Let's talk about M2. M2 includes M1 and savings deposits with post office savings organization. After independence, India was faced with a shortage of banks. It was not possible to open many banks in a short span of time. So the government came up with an idea that the post office can be used to accept deposits from the public. So small savers opened their savings account with post offices. M2 includes these deposits. So M2 stands for M1 and post office savings organizations holding savings deposits of the public. Let's talk about M3. M3 is less liquid than M2 and M1. M3 is M1 plus net time deposits with the commercial banks. Now what does this time deposits mean? As already discussed, time deposits means fixed deposits with the banks. Fixed deposits are those deposits which are deposited with the bank with a span for longer periods of time. A higher rate of interest is payable on it. These are not withdrawable before the expiry of that time except for emergencies or some value deductions. M3 is also known as broad money. Let's move on to M4, the last component of money supply. It is M3 plus total deposits with post office savings organization. M4 includes M3, which we have already discussed. It also includes total deposits with post office savings organization. Now, what do you mean by total deposits? When people started depositing their money with post offices, there were two schemes. Either you could open a savings account or either you could open a fixed deposit account. Under M4, we include both of these accounts. Of lately, people have now shifted towards modern banking structure and have abandoned the post offices to deposit their money. So what has happened is that M3 has started serving the purpose of broad money. So I hope you would have understood what is money supply. So in this session, we discussed about what is bank, what is banking, what are the two most important types of banks in our country, that is central bank and commercial bank, what is the difference between them, what are the functions of central bank. Then we moved on to the monetary policy which discussed about several quantitative and qualitative tools. We also discussed about the concept of money multiplier and ultimately this led us to discussion of money supply. I'll see you in the next session. Greeting from my side.